Good evening. This is uh, Kirk Fontaine, the host of Straight to the Bar Gym Chats. And tonight we are um, having an interview with Josh Hewitt, who is a personal trainer, uh, strength and conditioning coach. And I uh, want to go through some of his accomplishments. And today we're going to be talking about uh, hormonal optimization. Is that correct, Josh? Yeah, that's right, Kirk. And uh, again, I wanted to apologize uh, for those who are waiting to get started here. Um, my first uh, Google chat here and uh, having technical issues with the camera, but we'll go ahead. I can do a screen share here and still get some information out to you, and um, okay. I look okay. forward to another opportunity also to continue on this topic, and uh, I'll definitely get this sorted out. So apologize to everyone there that uh, the video uh, is not going to be, looks like it's not going to be working with me here. But okay. um, yes, yeah, so I look forward to getting into how we can uh, actually have an effect on on controlling our own hormones or at least regulating our own natural hormone production and how we can use certain nutritional and training strategies to to optimize our hormones for for greater fat loss and for better recovery okay uh, before you get started uh, could you give us a little background about yourself on how you got started as being a uh, personal trainer and strength training conditioning coach uh, sure, that'd be great, Kirk. Um, first of all, you can hear me okay? Yes, I can. Okay, excellent. Um, well, I got back, I got into it uh, as a, a teenager, actually. I was a, a pretty skinny kid, and uh, when I hit my first growth spurt in my teens, I, uh, I shot up to six feet tall, but um, I was a pretty lanky uh, teenager at that point, and uh, sort of stretched out and had a so sort of the string bean complex going on. And I'm sure a few listeners can identify with that uh, when you're in your teens. You know, self-image is uh, pretty important, and uh, I was pretty insecure about being so like tall and skinny. So that got me into working out. Uh, and I think that's a common reason for a lot of people, a lot of guys anyway, to start training. It's uh, to put on a little bit of muscle. Um, but it wasn't before uh, too long until actually working out and, and eating right in the whole fitness lifestyle became more of a passion to me rather than just a way to try and put on some some muscle and I started to learn as much as I could about exercise, nutrition and uh, the whole lifestyle surrounding it and uh, eventually turned it in, into a career so I got uh, personal training certification and went on to to later in my 30s to university for kinesiology and I started to work at uh, the big box gyms initially and from there on to private studios and then starting my own business. So it's been quite a journey and along the way I learned a lot as far as you know, what was prevalent in the mainstream fitness industry and at the beginning you, you know I'm sure a lot of fitness professionals or people that are interested in and in strength training can relate that when you learn a little bit you think you know everything and then as you start to learn a lot, you realize how little you actually know and how much there is to learn. Right. So I, uh, I started to realize that <clears throat> there's a lot, of, uh, a lot to learn in this industry and a lot of it uh, that we're hearing in the, sort of the mainstream fitness industry isn't necessarily the most effective or efficient ways to approach your goals. Uh, and uh, I always sort of took it for granted that as uh, someone in the fitness lifestyle, I'd always sort of be in shape because I exercise and I eat right, I thought. And, but if there's one thing that's consistent in life, it's change. And uh, I'm sure you can agree that things change, right? That's correct. Um, so that happened for me as well. And I, I, um, I was fortunate to meet a wonderful woman and uh, get married. And uh, we had a beautiful daughter, uh, four years old now and became a homeowner, or I like to say a mortgage owner, and uh, my business uh, started to expand. And I became busy, my priorities changed, mm -hmm. but um, I also turned 40 uh, a few years ago, and uh, I'm sure you can uh, relate that things changed then as well. That's right. If, there, if there's any listeners here, you know, getting towards middle age, uh, you know, not only does lifestyle change, but um, you also your body changes as your hormones start to change as you get middle age. You hit 40. Some people say they recognize it even in their late 30s. They start to feel this change. 
Right. And I started to see a change here. I, again, since I'm not uh, here, let me see if I can do a screenshot for you. Okay. Uh, and get a screen share since my video camera is not going. Uh, okay. Can you see that? I can. Uh, that, that's a. Um, okay, good. No, just let me see. Is that a before and after you can see there? Mm, no. Uh, I, okay. I see a, I see my screen basically, but I don't see the. Are you are you uh trying to get a website? I'm trying to just get upload a picture here. Um, okay. Okay. Let me just see here. Um, yeah, that's a hard one to to loop up. I guess I'd have to pop it up on this screen here, right? Um, okay. Anyway, I'll let me. I'll see if I can. Uh, Capture a, a photo for you, but okay. needless to say that I, by the time I um, I was in my forties and started to. Oh, are you seeing a multiple screen there? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I see up. a I see a black screen right now. <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay, I'm going to get exit out of there. Okay. Um, okay. So I noticed that I was. Uh, Starting to put on a little bit of weight as my lifestyle changed, and in all okay. ways that I used to stay in shape, didn't okay. seem to be cutting it anymore. So I uh, I noticed I had to look at some different methods of of staying in shape. Okay. And and along the way, I sought spoke to professionals and other people in the industry that were not doing things necessarily mainstream, and, and this opened my eyes to a lot of different techniques, and that's sort of, I'm happy to say I'm in my 40s now, and I'm in the best shape of my life, and a lot of this I'm learning, I'm sharing with my clients, and I'm obviously using it myself, and that's kind of what I wanted to talk about tonight. Okay. Um, so, did you want to uh, expand on, uh, let's see here, I'm, I'm going to go through some of your accomplishments here, if you don't mind. <laughs> Because uh, this is pretty impressive. Uh, you are a um, certified personal trainer specialist, strength and conditioning specialist. Uh, you have your certification in sports psychology, exercise in sports uh, psychology, weight management, advanced exercise nutrition. Um, you have taken uh, some courses on supplementation for training. Uh, and you also was an emergency medical care attendant. Now, is that like a paramedic? Yeah, that was level one paramedic uh, back in the day. That was sort of my first life. Um, and I didn't stay in the uh, in that field for, for very long, as a couple of years. Okay. Um, I realized that uh, that sort of uh, uh, trauma setting was not where I wanted to be, but um, I definitely... I, I definitely did uh, learn a lot about the body in, in, in that industry. Okay. Um, and then I went on from there to, to university for kinesiology. My goal initially there was to get into physical therapy, but uh, when I left and got into uh, training, expanded my business and personal training, it, it uh, was much more fulfilling to me and much more profitable. Um, and I, I just realized uh, that that's the avenue I wanted to go as opposed to Work for someone else as a therapist. I wanted to expand my own uh, my own interests in the field of fitness. Okay. So I did I did get into competing. Can you see uh, the screenshot now, or is that? Yeah, I can. I can see your screenshot. Can you see it before and after there? Yes, yeah. I can. Yeah. No, this is just after I I I, uh, I turned forty, um, and it was um, around uh, when my daughter was born. And okay. if there's any parents listening, I know I'm sure they can identify with. Things change as far as uh, your priorities, your sleep, uh, you know, how you eat. I mean, I was still trying to get my workouts in, and I was actually still pretty strong uh, there in the before. Um, but this is me. Uh, this past year, um, obviously, when I was, uh, my focus was to get very lean. Um, and I did compete in strength athletics. I did uh, uh, middleweight strongman competitions, and I was in powerlifting. So I was trying to keep as much weight on me as I could for a while, but... Right. Uh, after a while, being a natural athlete, it was very hard to do that um, to keep uh, you know lean muscle tissue on, and <clears throat> I started to, as you can see, at least in my opinion, not in the greatest shape there. And you can imagine how I felt being a fitness professional and a right. personal trainer 
and uh, you know, meant to be uh, an inspiration to other people and to get in shape. And that was sort of what I consider to be pretty out of shape there. Yeah. So uh, that motivated me in my 40s. I knew things had to change, and I uh, I took it on myself to to figure out what are the strategies, what are the most efficient and most time effective strategies to to get in shape. Okay. Okay. Impressive. Very impressive. Uh, let's go a bit about it, your training philosophy as it relates to hormonal optimization. Okay, yes. Um, well, that's when I started in my 40s. I started to realize that um, there was uh, a lot to learn around uh, how we can affect our hormones as we age. Um, and I started to look into what sort of training strategies and, and nutrition protocols we could do to control the hormones. There are a couple of the big hormones that, like, there, of course, there's a whole bunch of hormones that affect recovery, fat loss, um, you are actually increasing lean muscle tissue, and a lot of people are familiar with growth hormone, testosterone, insulin. Uh, I just want to focus on a couple of those tonight to okay. give people an idea of what, uh, what you can do to, to affect those, these basic hormones. Okay. Um, and uh, let's look at, uh, at, at, first of all, what hormones are. Now, to some people, this might be pretty basic, but um, I, what I look at hormones are just chemical messengers in the body that are produced by your organs to have an effect on your cells, and, okay. and those effects uh, cause changes in your body, obviously. And okay. Small changes in your hormones can affect big changes in your body over time. And hormones are very powerful things. So even though making changes in your natural hormone production is obviously nothing compared to uh, taking exogenous hormones, or like an athlete or a, a bodybuilder or a powerlifter taking, taking drugs, for example, right. they still make a difference. If you can optimize your natural production, this can still make a big difference over time. Okay. <laughs> so... Um, yeah, so what I, I look at uh, uh, hormones as, as sort of chemical, chemical messengers. Usually they're to try and keep the body's natural balance in check. Okay? okay. So let's look at first uh, growth hormone and insulin. And okay. a lot of people would look at insulin as, uh, when they talk about it, they look at, really realize it's related to, uh, to blood sugar. Um, you know, it's, it's secreted in response to when you eat carbohydrate foods. Um, <clears throat> I would qualify uh, insulin as a storage hormone. And to simplify it, what insulin really does is when you eat food, especially high carbohydrate or sugar foods, uh, insulin levels rise up and it, and it stores that, those the carbs as energy in your muscle or in your liver or in fat. And an interesting thing about insulin is that when your insulin levels are really high, it tends to slow the release of fat as a fuel. So it, it, it sort of limits your body releasing fats as energy source. So I, also, if you have a constantly elevated insulin levels, it, it can increase oxidative stress on your body, sort of, sort of speeds up the aging process. So, I mean, insulin's got a pretty bad rap, and, and for, for good reason in a lot of ways, because it... It basically increases storage and slows down the release of fat. And so we want to really control that. And some of this may just be a review, but I think it's important to look at this as well. Um, and this is more important, again, especially as you, as you get older uh, or if you've had blood sugar issues or, or hormonal imbalances, this is something where you can really start to make a difference. <laughs> um, Okay. If you're, if you're training regularly and you're healthy and active and you're in a calorie deficit, it's not going to create as much of a, an issue for you. But to control your insulin production, you're going to you want to reduce your carbohydrate intake, um, which I mean that doesn't mean a no carb diet, but definitely balance your energies with uh, proteins and fats being a little higher than your carbs, and choosing lower glycemic index carbohydrates rather than um, than the simple or the, uh, the, the quick carbs or high glycemic carbs. And then there are certain forms of exercise which can really help regulate your insulin production. We'll get into that. Okay. Uh, again, some of this might be review, but I think uh, it would help to just sort of quickly review a basic idea of what a glycemic index is. Okay. Or, um, 
So if you can, uh, can you see that? Yes, I can. Okay, so again, I um, apologize for those of you who are pretty advanced going through the basics, but we're just going to cut through it quickly so everyone's on the same page. Okay. Um, in general, if you can focus your carbohydrate intake on what would be low glycemic index carbs, which is this column here, uh, such as yams uh, instead of potatoes, for example, <coughs> yams or sweet potatoes, brown rice instead of white rice, quinoa, uh, other grains such as uh, oats, like real oatmeal, steel cut oats, um, buckwheat, millet, and uh, vegetables. Okay. Some fruits, especially berries, uh, are also very low in the glycemic index. Oh, really? These I are often called. These are often, yeah, even though berries are very sweet, they're actually very low sugar. And these are often called complex or slow releasing carbs. Okay. An interesting thing is quinoa and uh, buckwheat are actually often referred to as grains, but they're actually seeds. Uh, so then we get over to the high glycemic index and or simple quick carbs, <coughs> and I call them the deadly whites. Uh, white potatoes, white rice, white pasta, white bread, white flour, white sugar. So you can see a common element there. Right. Um, as soon as you start juicing fruit, it becomes uh, a very quick-released uh, sugar or carbohydrate as well. Most cereals would be pretty quick carbohydrates, unless it's like a real brand. Um, and then, of course, your, your desserts and sweets and candies and pastries. So okay. in general, we want to focus on consuming more of the low glycemic index carbohydrates. That might be pretty obvious to someone, but if you want to have a positive effect on your insulin, that's where you want to go. <clears throat> now, having said that, um, there, I don't want to create this impression that all carbs are bad necessarily. Okay. Basically, carb, uh, sorry, all, sorry, all the hor uh, insulin isn't bad. Like all hormones have a point. They all have uh, a purpose and. For example, um, insulin is, is a storage hormone. It can really help to optimize your insulin production after a workout. Having higher insulin can be useful. It can help to increase the, the uptake of nutrients okay. to your body post-workout. So surrounding a workout, you might want to consume some simple carbohydrates to, to try and optimize that. So uh, I'm just sort of saying that let's not look at eliminating this, but let's look at... Um, just regulating it and keeping a positive balance. Okay. So, does that, that make sense? That should be pretty clear. That's probably your view for a lot of people. Uh, okay. Can I get into uh, to growth hormone now? Yes, you can. <clears throat> okay. Um, so, once we uh, sort of get our insulin in check and and try to keep it under control by limiting our carbohydrates and choosing a certain uh, type of carbohydrate when we do have it, and then timing around our workouts. Uh, we can also optimize our, our growth hormone production. Now, uh, what is growth hormone? A lot of people would understand growth hormone, and a lot of my, my fat loss clients are sort of scared of it because they hear the word growth and they assume, oh, it's going to make me big. Right. But, Really, it's, it's, it's kind of deceiving the name growth hormone. It's, it's called growth because it's highest during uh, you know, youth, adolescence, childhood, and growth hormone is highest then to sort of help us reach maturity. Um, right. And once we, are, once we do reach maturity, and everyone listening tonight, I assume, is, uh, is in that audience, it serves a different purpose, and that's uh, primarily for cell repair and regeneration. Uh, it also helps to increase fat metabolism and that basically, uh, growth hormone helps keep us looking and feeling younger and leaner. So we we do want to optimize our growth hormone production. Uh, I prefer to call it for this reason the youth hormone. That's highest in our youth, and uh, when it, we optimize it later in life, it helps us uh, to continue to look and feel young. So <clears throat> this is something that if we can find certain uh, methods to our training nutrition to optimize it, that's great. Um, that's obviously for guys like uh, me and you, uh, you know, we're, we're past our 40s and uh, we want to, to keep our, our, our youth and, and regenerate as well as we can. And we want to optimize this naturally as long as we can. Right, An right. interesting thing to, to note about uh, growth hormone, human growth hormone naturally being produced by the body, is that if you have <clears throat> consistently higher levels of insulin being produced, a high level of insulin will tend to suppress uh, the production of growth hormone. 
So that ah, one, yeah. and so when your insulin levels are pretty high, your, your growth hormone will, will tend to be low. Um, let me uh, see if I can get a little. I mean that that should be pretty clear, but get a all little right, screenshot right. for you here. All right. <clears throat> now this is um, that's just a simple graph that just shows uh, blood hormone levels for growth hormone insulin. As your insulin tends to spike up, it's going to have a, a slight suppressing effect on your growth hormone that can de depress the, the release of, of growth hormone in your body. Okay. And another reason why, if we want to optimize growth hormone, we might want to, to uh, you know, control or moderate our production of insulin. Um, and that's that's something that might be uh, useful to uh, to those who sort of say, well, as long as I'm training, you know, and I, I'm in a calorie deficit, I can eat, you know, my carbs can come from whatever source they want, like the, if it fits your macros guys who have a lot, there's a lot of sense to that that uh, method of eating for sure. Right. But this might be a reason why, hey, maybe maybe it does matter the types of, of foods you eat, the types of carbohydrates you choose. Okay. Is that pretty clear? Yes. Okay. Um, so let's, uh, let's get into uh, how we can optimize our, our growth hormone production then. Okay. Because uh, we looked at how we can regulate our our insulin growth hormone is highest during. Well, let me ask you that: do, Are you aware when, like, when would you think that your growth hormone levels tend to be highest for natural athletes? Hmm. Um. Probably during during their, during their training. Okay, good. A uh, high-intensity resistance training definitely puts a real spike that gets a big pulse of, of uh, growth hormone going, <clears throat> depending on the type of exercise and duration. Right. Um, the other hot time when it's the highest is during sleep. Um, so during uh, deep quality sleep, our growth hormone levels are, are tend to be pretty high. Uh, if it's okay. uninterrupted and it's, uh, it's a quality sleep, and there are a number of reasons for that. One of them is you're fasted, unless we... Uh, you know, you're waking up during the night for several midnight snacks. Um, uh, most of us uh, tend to be fasting while we're asleep or not eating. Um, now, during periods of fasting, when you have an, em an empty stomach for several hours, uh, that can help optimize your, your natural growth hormone production. And like you said, in response to certain types of exercise, which we'll get right. into. So given that uh, growth hormone is highest during a fasted state, um, we want to optimize the length of time we have an empty stomach. Now again, I've had discussions with people who believe that, you know, when you're, I think it's sort of prevalent in the mainstream fitness in industry, like don't eat before you go to bed, uh, that will turn into fat because your metabolism is slowest at night, yada, yada. Yeah. A lot of what I've been reading now, it, it really, you know, eating these multiple times a day, it may have its benefits. But it doesn't really like stoke your metabolism. It doesn't matter if you eat eight times a day. It's not necessarily going to, you know, hyperdrive your metabolic rate. You can eat two or three times a day as long as your calories and your macronutrients are in check and your food choices are good. It's not necessarily going to have a positive or negative effect versus eight meals a day on your fat loss. Okay. Um, and eating at nighttime uh, isn't necessarily going to make mean it's going to turn to, turn into fat if you eat before sleep. Okay. But what it may do is interrupt uh, your optimizing your growth hormone production because <clears throat> ideally having an empty stomach during the, the time you're asleep uh, can optimize that. So if you're eating really late at night, right before sleep, you may be robbing yourself of a few hours of, of higher growth hormone levels. So that's one thing to consider about maybe uh, not eating directly before before sleeping. And there are other digestive issues. Some people don't digest it well when they're, they're lying down, like, uh, you know, um, acid reflux, etc. So Trying to have an empty stomach before sleep can help. Um, perhaps having your uh, uh, branched chain amino acids before sleep or a, a glutamine just to get some aminos in, that will uh, have less of an impact on your insulin and, and help you optimize your growth hormone as well. But <clears throat> extending the time that you have an empty stomach and improving the quality of your sleep can really have a positive effect on growth hormone. Okay. Uh, having said that, one controversial method for in, uh, increasing this, the time, the duration you have an empty stomach is called intermittent fasting. And you probably heard about that because it's sort of become, um, it's almost, even though it's sort of controversial and outside the mainstream, 
Yes. It's, it's, it's sort of become a fad now. <laughs> and uh, I've been following, I follow a few other fitness professionals online, and a lot of them who were, who were sort of dissing it before are now, you know, touting its, uh, its benefits. Um, and intermittent fasting I've used for this, I mean, this past year and a half, I've used it off and on when I was really trying to get lean. And you saw in that, uh, that after photo I took uh, when I sort of got to single digit body fat percentage. Um, that was one of the, the ways I was eating. I wasn't reducing necessarily the amount I was eating each day any further, but I was controlling when I ate, okay. <clears throat> basically. Uh, I, I think this is a topic uh, we had discussed maybe getting in another Google chat on at yeah. another time, which we can get into greater detail. Right. Um, but basically, uh, it's talking about you still get the same uh, number of macronutrients and calories you need, but you shorten your eating window. So you maybe have an 8 to 10 hour window that you can eat, and you try and extend the empty stomach the time you have empty stomach for like at least 16 hours of the day. So perhaps okay. you, you stop eating at 8 o'clock at night, and you don't eat anything until lunch the next day, and preferably after a workout. So you're actually doing your, your workout on having an empty stomach for 16 hours. And a lot of people would argue, well, I'm not going to have any energy if I've had an empty stomach for that long. You know, right. where's that energy going to come from? I, I, you know, I, I'll be fainting, etc. But you'd be surprised once you get into it after a couple of uh, times trying this. You, you really get efficient at using your, your body fat as a fuel source. And I, I found it. I had more energy. My recovery was better. And mm -hmm. eating my first meal of the day after my first workout of the day, um, I was having so much ba better uh, nutrient partitioning. I was like, my muscles were soaking everything up. Uh, right. I was optimizing my insulin production when I needed it and extending the amount of time that my growth hormones were high, giving my digestive system a break. So there's a number benefits around this and, and uh, again next time hopefully having my camera all set up uh, when we get into it we can we can go through all the virtues and issues to consider regarding intermittent fasting it's something I recommend people sort of Google and do a little looking into uh, right. just out of curiosity okay. um, and I mean maybe we can talk about this at the end as well but on my website it's uh, top-form-fitness.com um, okay. there's uh, my blog on there I just recently posted a uh, a pretty in-depth uh, post or article on intermittent fasting as well. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, I did. I did uh, uh, browse that a little bit. And a little okay, bit. great. Yeah. So maybe at the end we can uh, I can leave some links for people to check out on that too. But um, that'd be great. Uh, after, if you have a minute, we'll we'll go through and make sure I got this all set up right. And next time we'll uh, we'll get right into that. I think that'd be an interesting topic for people here. Oh yeah, I, I'm interested in it as well because I would love to try that. Yeah, yeah, no, it's great. I mean, you want to, you don't want to just jump into like, well, I'm just going to not eat for a certain amount of time. There's, there's some ways to definitely to do it that uh, you can get better effect out of it. But yeah, I got stronger and leaner when I was doing that, which I was surprised. I thought, okay, I'm going to lose some fat, but I'll probably lose a lot of muscle too. It was the opposite. I, uh, I attempted, attempted to keep keep a lot of my lean tissue during losing that last few percentage of body fat. So. Um, and there's reasons for that, and we'll get into that in another chat. But okay. um, so yeah, like I said, making sure you have quality sleep, and then looking at extending the amount of time you have an empty stomach a few times a week can really okay. be helpful. Now let's get into the, the forms of exercise. You touched on that during uh, high intensity types of training. Right. You also optimize your growth hormone production, <clears throat> and okay. that's true. And there are studies to back that up. Now. Uh, to what extent uh, differs by, versus different studies, and some people argue well. Hey, it, you know, it's such a small increase. Really, does it make that much difference? Um, well, I've read some studies that show you can have uh, either a, up to a double the production, up to 500% increase in growth hormone production during uh, periods of intermittent fasting, which is even more increased if you include this form of of training while you're on a, a fast day uh, called high intensity interval training. Now, obviously. Okay. That's another form of training which has become very popularized and somewhat controversial in that I'd argue the mainstream fitness industry was promoting um, was promoting like long slow cardio and calorie deficit as the main way to lose fat for a long time now. <clears throat> okay. People were realizing that if they're doing hours of cardio every day and reducing their calories and probably not getting enough protein. They were losing weight, but they were losing a lot of lean tissue, 
uh, messing with their hormones and, uh, and and having a negative effect on their metabolism. And basically, they just you know, if they look like crap, they're just like a smaller version of looking like crap, right? Yeah. So high intensity interval training, in my experience and and from what I've read and in my opinion, is far superior form of cardio type training than long slow cardio. And one of the reasons for that is besides being far more efficient, time efficient, I mean, it, it, you know, 10 to 20 minutes max, two to three times a week, you know, versus four or five times a days a week of for an hour or more of long slow cardio, it, it's no comparison, especially for how busy people are nowadays. Right. You know, right. <clears throat> even if they were close to being as effective as one another, definitely more time efficient. The other reason is uh, high intensity interval training, which is basically alternating periods of high intensity and lower intensity cardiovascular training has a, a positive effect on your growth hormone production. Okay. So, um, now I don't want to set this aside here. There's some people uh, posting some chats and comments and questions. Is that, um, <clears throat> am I, do you want me to be replying to those? Is this something you can get to at the end? You, 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 uh, you can. You can if you like. Okay. Uh, now, Matt, Matt, thanks for joining us, Matt. Um, I see here that you've uh, you've had a couple of questions along the way there. Uh, low GI. Um, now, is there anything you you, you just talked about uh, uh, interval training here? He asked, um, what about doing like a 10 second sprint and then a minute of like slower recovery for alternating now? Uh, we can get into all the different variables. And again, I have a good post on my blog <clears throat> at top-form-fitness.com. You can go to my blog there. Um, <clears throat> one of my recent posts was uh, on interval training, different methods. Pardon me, I'm just going to get a quick drink. <clears throat> okay, I'm back. So <clears throat> there's different methods such as Tabata. Um, there's... Uh, <clears throat> One minute recovery, 30 seconds hard. Uh, there's 30 on, 30 off. The key is that you pick a duration, preferably between 15 to 30 seconds, <clears throat> where you're going to be challenging yourself with high intensity cardiovascular based exercise. Now, that could also be a body weight type exercise. You can, you can make push ups and body weight squats and uh, <clears throat> lunges into like a cardiovascular movement if you're approaching it with the right intensity. But usually, um, the simplest way is on a bicycle. <clears throat> but uh, yes, you're, you're right, Matthew. If you're going hard for 10 seconds, a 10 second sprint, like you're doing sprints outdoors, and give yourself 30 to 60 seconds recovery before your next sprint, that would work fine. And you'd want to do this for at least four minutes <clears throat> and no longer than 20 minutes. Um, one method, and I'm, I'm going to be offering this as a, a free court. Yeah, that's more towards fat loss. That's right, Matt. <clears throat> Um, but uh, but this also is beneficial for gaining lean tissue because um, there are some negatives to long slow cardio. <clears throat> now I'm sure people argue with me on this. A lot of bodybuilders use long slow cardio uh, in preparing for contests. I'm sure you know under certain circumstances it's fine, but ex done excessively, uh, uh, long slow cardio or like marathon type workouts of 45 minutes to an hour or more multiple times a week in a steady state uh, can actually increase cortisol production. <clears throat> and that's another hormone that I briefly we can just get into. It. It's uh, the st a stress hormone. And when your body is doing this long duration uh, endurance type activity, it, it, it produces more stress hormone um, to help you deal with. Uh, and now cortisol, has, again, no hormone is inherently good or bad. <clears throat> we just want to keep a, a balance that favors us staying leaner, yeah, like losing, uh, reducing our body fat, keeping muscle, and, and being strong. Would you agree? Yes. Yeah, yes. Like, I mean, <clears throat> cortisol helps keep inflammation down, which is great. Like, it helps reduce inflammation in the body. Cortisol helps us break down tissue in the body to, to release blood sugar for energy. So we might need that in emergency situations. Now, we probably don't want to be tearing down our muscle tissue, catabolizing that for energy uh, by doing long, slow cardio. Uh, if it's not an emergency situation, um, we probably don't want to have those, those stress hormone levels that high, uh, you know, if, if it's not absolutely necessary for survival. So, 
<clears throat> yes, geared towards fat loss, but um, I would argue if you're going to do uh, um, a form of cardio <clears throat> and your goal is to gain lean tissue and strength, I would slant towards high-intensity interval training as well for maintaining lean tissue and having less interference with, uh, with strength gains. Um, and that saying, if you recall, it's cortisol on an empty stomach can help with mobilizing fat stores. Um, and he, he's questioning, me, questioning if, that, if that's the case. Um, I, I, haven't, uh, I haven't heard that, but it does, cortisol does help you break down tissue to release it as energy. So perhaps it could help you break down fat as a fuel, but I definitely know it will, um, it will help you break down lean tissue as well to, to release proteins into your system to use as well on an empty stomach. Um, I think you'd be better off keeping cortisol in general on, uh, on a down low and, and optimizing growth hormone in the long run. Um, one thing with cortisol or even other stress hormones, which is part of the reason with using a lot of pre-workouts on an ongoing basis, if your adrenaline epinephrine levels are high for a long time, <clears throat> your stress hormone levels are high, that can also uh, increase or lead to, especially cortisol, abdominal fat storage. So even as you're getting leaner, it can be challenging to get rid of that last layer of abdominal fat. And a lot of people are under a lot of stress or not getting a lot of sleep. Not only are typically are their growth hormone levels pretty low, but they uh, their stress hormone levels are causing that, you know, the stress belly or the cortisol belly. So, um, if you want to get rid of that little punch, keeping your cortisol under control might be a, a good way to. Anyway, that's another whole discussion. <clears throat> From my experience, when I'm learning, I'm I'm highly encouraging people to look more into high intensity interval training. Uh, done moderately, like I said, like uh, four minutes. Uh, you know, tobacco protocol is like. Um, uh, 20 seconds on, 10 seconds recovery, alternating that for only four minutes. And that's pretty challenging. Like, I use that as like a, a post-workout to optimize my growth hormone, increase fat burning, sort of like an afterburn effect after my strength training workouts to a quick Tabata. <clears throat> and uh, four minutes, you can get a good benefit from that. But uh, if you're doing it as a standalone workout, 15 to 20 minutes, eventually you do like 60 seconds slow recovery, 30 seconds hard on a bike, for example. And this is when you get your conditioning up. When I'm talking about going hard, ideally you really want to be, if you're looking at a level of perceived exertion of 10 being all out, like there's no, you couldn't go any possibly harder. You look at a level eight, or maybe even if you're well conditioned, a level nine, if you're doing like a 20, maybe 30 second sprint, like uh, or high intensity interval, that would be as if like an angry dog was chasing you. You want That's how hard you want to be pushing those little intervals. So you really want to sprint with when you're doing the interval, like give yourself 30 to 60 seconds to, to regroup and recover before the next hard all out sprint. <clears throat> so, and again, yeah, uh, Matt touched on, yeah, back to simplicity of training, or I talk about efficiency of training, more bang for your buck. So really, you know, we don't have all day to, to do, you know, two hour workout, at least I don't, uh, you know, two hour long workouts and, <clears throat> you know, hit, hit the uh, cardio uh, four days, five days a week for an hour. So definitely, if there are benefits to it and you can get it done in, uh, Less than 45 minutes a week, um, the interval training has its benefits. Now, one benefit to interval training is that uh, high-intensity interval training, um, we talked about the problems with long slow cardio, <clears throat> is that uh, interval training also has a, an afterburn effect. And now yeah, I remember, I, yeah. Yeah, I remember uh, actually reading about that. Yeah. Now, some people have exaggerated how powerful that actually is. Um, some people say, you know, it's huge. You're going to be for, the, for a full day after an interval workout. You're going to be having an elevated metabolism. And it's going to be burning all, the, all this fat for you. Uh, from what I've looked at, it's uh, afterburn effect uh, lasts a few hours post-workout uh, where it's really dramatic. And um, <clears throat> your body temperature is elevated in your, you know, it's the post-exercise oxygen debt because you've, you were training an intensity with which your body it's not. It's, it's anaerobic. You couldn't get in enough oxygen to recover during the workout. Uh, for several hours after, your body's trying to make up that oxygen debt, and and that's causing an elevated metabolism. So you're not only getting a, a little boost to your growth hormone due to the intensity of the exercise, which actually it, it acts on your um, <clears throat> pituitary to 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 do a little burst of growth hormone <clears throat> with that high intensity sprint. You're also getting this afterburn effect, which is causing elevated fat metabolism for a few hours post-workout. So there are a number of reasons why it's very effective and very efficient to use interval training. 
uh, and just like resistance trading. And Matt just touched on it there. Um, thanks for joining us, Matt. He, he, he's my, uh, he can be my, uh, my co-speaker today. <laughs> uh, yeah, so that's great. Uh, no, that's true. And, and that's, you touched on that too, Kirk. Uh, resistance mm -hmm. trading done with appropriate intensity also has a positive effect on growth hormone. And, and one way to, and this is not probably to most of our listeners here, and I know straight to the bar, um, from my experience, as um, it's a pretty educated group of people on here, which is great. <clears throat> oh, yeah. Definitely. I'm sure they're familiar with, um, you know, some of the benefits of, of intense resistance training regarding your hormones. And um, one of that is uh, that choosing the right exercises. So choosing compound multi-joint exercises <clears throat> that use several muscle groups in one movement, like big pushing and pulling exercises, deadlifts, squats, uh, you know, pushes and pulls as opposed to isolation movements have a, a more profound effect on, on your, your hormone production. And, uh, and then training those movements with the appropriate intensity, um, you know, challenging yourself with each exercise will also have a uh, positive effect on growth hormone and also some studies show on testosterone, especially if you increase the intensity via reducing rest intervals. Um, and that can be done through supersetting, like antagonist supersetting. Uh, even strength circuits can have that effect. <clears throat> oh, yeah, squatting. Matt says, yep, yeah, definitely squats and deadlifts are the big boys um, for this. But, yeah, it, I mean, there may be a, a little trade-off with if your goal is pure strength when you reduce rest intervals. Um, and you want to uh, you, you definitely strength might be compromised. Your recovery is a little less. So it really depends on if your goal is body composition or strength, you have to, to weigh that. Um, and even if you're doing like three to five minute rests for you know, powerlifting type workouts, you're still having a positive effect on growth hormone through the, uh, just the intensity of the big compound movements you're using. <clears throat> but if you wanted to optimize testosterone production and growth hormone and have a greater effect on your afterburn, uh, then what I call metabolic resistance training would, would work really well. Keeping your uh, your rest intervals down, working with antagonist supersets, doing a short strength circuit. And this isn't new. Even the uh, the, the Menser enthusiasts, uh, like the, the hit guys, <coughs> high intensity training guys, often did circuits. Um, like they would try and hit you know a few big muscle groups for a set or two uh, through a full circuit, as opposed to straight sets on one exercise. Um, and there's some pros and cons of that type of training, but basically, <clears throat> well, even nowadays, like I, uh, when I was doing my powerlifting, I'd always pick my key movement, my big squat, deadlift, overhead, or bench, and then my accessory movements, I would always superset them. I would pair them up. Like I would do a push-pull uh, on a bench day. I would do some chin-ups and uh, overhead as accessory. Uh, I superset those two. On my uh, deadlift day, I would do um, a single leg, uh, push with a hamstring like a glute ham developer and had superset them back and forth and the, uh, the accessory movements. <clears throat> and that had a, a positive effect on strength as well as um, metabolism and worked really well and it, it was made the workout much more uh, intense and uh, time efficient as well. So that's something to consider uh, with regards to structure workouts related to hormones. Um, <clears throat> and obviously making strength training and high intensity interval training uh, the focus of your workout rather than long, drawn-out strength workouts and uh, uh, lots of slow cardio has a, a, a more positive effect on building lean tissue, uh, which in the end is, is better for your uh, body composition and your metabolism as well. <clears throat> the nice thing about uh, building lean tissue and actually strength training workouts, when we're talking about insulin, uh, we talked about some ways with nutrition to control insulin production. Strength training is a great way to increase insulin sensitivity. So we talked about when, if you were going to have simple carbohydrates around your workout, would be a good time to optimize that storage hormone so you uptake more nutrients into the muscle. <clears throat> when you complete a uh, strength training workout, the, the, the surface of your muscle cells become more sensitive to, sensitive to insulin and you improve partitioning of nutrients into the muscles rather than into fat or liver. So uh, you, you're going to store that, that this, you're going to store that those uh, energy that energy somewhere, right? It has to be in fat and liver or muscle cells. So you want to optimize that into muscle. Um, 
So that's another way. Your strength training will improve insulin sensitivity and having more muscle on your body also helps regulate insulin as well, production. So all around, this is a beneficial way to train for a hormonal optimization period. Okay. <laughs> now tell that to the marathon runners. I have some clients that just like, oh, I got a runner's high, I love it, and I stay lean. I was like, dude, you're, you're skinny fat, but you're not lean. So, I mean, we, I mean, I can show you, we've all seen those, the pictures of uh, the marathon runner versus the, um, the sprinter, right? Right. Um, and I, I look at that as a pretty good example of uh, why intensity of exercise is, uh, is far superior, even if your goal is fat loss, versus the um, long and slow. And here's that picture here. Okay. Um, can you see it? Oh, yes. Yeah, it's, it's pretty small, but you get the picture, yeah. Which would you rather have, you know what I mean? So, which kind of physique would you would you rather develop? Oh, um, definitely. <clears throat> definitely the right one, I would think. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so that's, that, those are the basic um, keys to, uh, to, to increasing or optimizing your, your production of growth hormone, controlling your production of, of insulin, which also has a positive effect on growth hormone, uh, minimizing the production of cortisol, and, uh, and obviously, you know, optimizing body composition and, and you know, helping you look and feel younger and leaner. Um, <clears throat> now, okay, uh, Matt is, say, is saying uh, they're basically uh, drug addicts, though. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah, the runner's high, dopamine. Uh, affect the, the feel-good hormones that people get from doing long-distance cardio. Now, yeah, that, that's a good point, actually. You know, it, there, there is a balance between, for training, and I tell this to my clients, too, between what's the most effective and efficient way to train and what you like doing. I mean, I'd rather have someone who's just really inactive to get them in, in going on something. You have to incorporate something they enjoy initially, too, right? So <clears throat> if that means they want to go for a, a slow jog once a week, just because they love how it feels, okay, but I'm talking about how it can be counterproductive if it's like multiple days a week for long duration. Mm -hmm. Really, how, no matter how much you like it, if your goal is to get leaner and maintain lean tissue and look good and be, look, you know, look younger and live longer, that might not be the best way to do it. Um, okay, I, I want to tell a little story based on this because it's one of the principles as far as optimizing body composition and, and, and hormones. Okay. Um, if there's these two twins. It's a little analogy I, I tell the clients to it. And they're identical twins. They, they go to the same trainer who puts them on the exact same nutrition and uh, training uh, plan, which they're both performing on their own. <clears throat> Let's say they both have a very single, similar job and sleep schedule. And they both, um, they're, they're identical twins. They follow this training nutrition plan for a year. They both get results. But one of them is completely transformed by the end of the year. He's much leaner. Uh, he's gaining lean tissue. He, he, he looks great. Um, the other one lost some weight and is a little stronger, but really not as significant of a change. And they're, like, you're thinking, wow, these guys are the same genetics, basically. They're on the same workout plan. They're on the same nutrition plan. What would you, get? What would you say would be the main difference between there are two, the, the two of them. Why would you say the one would be getting better results? <clears throat> Matt's saying desire to want to will. Um, that's, that's pretty close. And consistency. Okay, let's say we're following the program, though. Right. Tweak, any idea? Mm, no. Okay. I, the, what, what I'm trying to get at is to think as intensity. And that's one variable we talked about in, in training with resistance training. It's the intensity you train at with your high intensity interval training. It's intensity as far as instead of uh, duration. And uh, you can have the same program. And our intensity, people define it differently. Some people say it's strictly how much weight you lift. Um, right. Some people say it's the effort you put in. But basically, I'm, I'm saying how, how much effort and how hard the one person pushes themselves with the same program and same eating plan is going to make a big difference in the long term versus the other person who's basically going through the motions on the same training program. So when you hit the gym and you take 
I'm on that program from the pro trainer who designed it just for you, it's still on you to attack it with the appropriate intensity and challenge yourself with that program in the long term. So that would be the one thing, uh, takeaway as far as training that I would, I would just leave with people is uh, make sure that you're putting the appropriate effort and intensity into each workout and that you see the progression on the long term rather than just saying, well, I'm doing the exercises. Uh, right. if, you want to, if you want to optimize your results and, and optimize your hormones. Okay. Okay. Now, now this is based on the fact that they have their they have the same genetics, uh, the, the same uh, training standards, and all of that, right? Right. Yeah. It's just an analogy. It's just a story. I say that Gabby, yeah, you can be doing the same program, but one of them's just working harder at it, basically. So uh, it, that's the, the element of, of perceived exertion, or the element of how hard, how much they're willing to put into it. So right, right. you know. Don't be afraid to work at it. You got to you got to uh, invest yourself, and you got to invest energy to to make it to uh, to get what you want out of the the program. Right, right. Well, try to tap your potential, basically. Exactly. Um, okay. Now, are there any? Uh, I don't know if there's who else is on here. We I know we started a little late, so I apologize to anyone who was uh, okay. hoping to get on and uh, and at the beginning and was waiting to ask some questions here. Um, but Kirk, if you have any questions, or Matt, do you have any other uh, questions? Well, well I, I, I just want to summarize something about uh, the hormone optimization. Now, basically, uh, we went through the growth hormone, insulin, testosterone. Did you touch upon the testosterone? Okay, that's a good question. I briefly did touch on testosterone related to intensity of training. If you were to incorporate um, supersetting, uh, keep the rest intervals down. Um, and you're using big compound movements. Some studies have shown that they do have a positive effect on on uh, the release of testosterone at a certain point in your workout. And again, duration might be a consideration here. Whereas some studies, <clears throat> these vary. Like I've seen new ones coming out that say it's not as much of an issue as they thought it was. But in general, if you can train at appropriate intensity for like 45 minutes to a little over an hour, um, or half an hour to a, an hour and a half maximum, the longer you go with a high intensity, the, the less of a, a positive effect you can have on your, your hormone production. Generally, if you can if you can finish your workout in around an hour of working hard, your hormone levels will tend to peak during that workout. And finishing the workout while you're on a hormonal high, so to speak, where your testosterone levels have been released and they're circulating a little bit higher, and you, your growth hormone levels are up, um, that can help with uh, increasing the tissue recovery. Um, protein synthesis, um, and and you you could potentially milk that slightly higher level of, of hormones for a little while after your workout if you if you're stopping. Uh, also, I, I use workout finishers like I talked about briefly. Um, uh, a short little interval training sprint, like for four minutes at the end of a workout. Some people do like the prowler prowler sprints or a little bit of sled dragging or um, other high intensity finishers. <coughs> pardon me, post workout. Uh, or like GPP or metabolic conditioning um, to sort of give themselves um, a boost at the end of the workout and they find it improves recovery and uh, part of the reason for that may be that you're you're increasing that burst of growth hormone at the end of your workout. You're optimizing hormones post-workout and you're creating that afterburn effect that, that, that elevates your metabolism. <clears throat> now another thing that's looking at with um, increasing testosterone uh, are nutrient choices as well. <clears throat> Now we talked about for growth hormone, maybe you want to keep your um, your starchy carbohydrates, your simple carbs, down a little bit so that you're not your insulin's not always jacked up. That helps to keep your hormone. And maybe look at ways to increase, have an empty stomach for a little bit longer during the night. Um, for testosterone, they show that um, you, to produce a lot of different hormones actually, but especially testosterone, you need fats and and you need uh, particularly saturated fats. Right. And that's something that's received a bad rap. I mean, I'm just tired of nutritionists saying that, oh, you got to reduce your saturated fat intake. Really what I'd say is you got to reduce your processed food intake. you got to reduce your, your processed fat intake. Right. Like, um, <laughs> uh, so we have Matt here saying, uh, oh, so McDonald's is healthy, right? <laughs> so I'm not going out for Matt. Good luck. Nice try, though. Um, but, I mean, hey, I enjoy my burger. I just don't eat the buns, right? Right. But, um, but 
but uh, yeah, definitely uh, if it's not a processed fat, like a uh, hydrogenated vegetable oil, I can't stand it when people say like margarine is healthier than butter, like because uh, butter has saturated fat in it. I'm like, butter is a natural occurring fat, it's a natural food. Um, <clears throat> and most margarines are like hydrogenated processed vegetable oils. They're the worst thing for you. It doesn't oh, okay. matter that they're, they're lower in saturated fats. Um, that you need a certain amount of, of saturated fat and cholesterol in your diet. It's right. really, and a lot of studies have shown your body really has issues with cholesterol when your sugar intake is really high. And this causes a lot of, of, of issues with your um, uh, scarring of your arteries and, and a lot of like uh, issues with your arteries and your body tries to, to heal that by placking cholesterol on your arteries to, to, to heal it. <clears throat> right. So the cholesterol is there as a, like a coping mechanism, a healing thing. And the you know mainstream medical profession is saying, oh, so cholesterol is bad because you're, it's, it's lining your artery walls. So we have to cut out cholesterol. Well, why, why is it? It's, it's there for a reason. It's like if you have a scab on your arm, you're like, oh, you know, the, those uh, scarring tissues are, are bad because it's creating the scab. We're going to rip that off and stop giving you clotting stuff so you, you get rid of all your blood clotting things. You'll bleed out. Like, you, right. you need. <clears throat> so, I mean, this is obviously debatable, too, and people have to educate themselves on this. This is just from my reading and my, my experience, so I won't get into debating, but I, I welcome people to, to, who are watching this after the fact to you know, hook up with me and, and, uh, and, and chat about it if they're interested in learning more, and I'm totally open to hearing different points of view, but in general, if you want to optimize your testosterone levels, you need to have at least a little bit of consumption of your of saturated fat and cholesterol in your diet. Your body will use that to produce hormones, so right. don't try and cut your fats out too low. And uh, Matt here in the comments section is saying, um, uh, first of all, he's saying, hey, screw uh, throwing away the buns when I eat a burger. I'm a strong man. I can eat whatever I want, basically. Um, and uh, but he's mentioning, um, he's, you know, it was, it was funny that uh, vegetable oil is, uh, is not a particularly healthy kind of oil. And that's right. Like corn oil, not, not an oil you want to be eating a lot of. Um, and it is a vegetable oil. <clears throat> Pardon me. Cut out the vegetable oils and the vegetable oil margarines and all that crap, and get with like uh, the olive oil and saturated fat oils like coconut oil. Start looking into the benefits of coconut oil for cooking. Um, not only is that antiviral, antibacterial, has a great effect on your hormone levels, and it's a it's a terrific natural fat, coconut oil, and even butter. Um, and then there's other uh, there's uh, grapeseed uh, oil. Um, uh, there's a, a number of different uh, oils that are, uh, you know, been given, the like coconut oil just to be given a bad rap back in the day because it's high in saturated fat, but now people realize, oh, it's high in uh, MCTs, medium chain triglycerides, which are great for energy. Right. Um, <clears throat> people are taking coconut oil pre workout and stuff. So, um, yeah, definitely the vegetable oils are not necessarily the healthiest option, and typically they're hydrogenated and they don't. Uh, process very well when they're under high temperatures. So that's something you want to start, uh, people might want to look into a little bit. Uh, Dr. Mercola.com uh, uh, is a good site for some of these references. He interviews a lot of alternative professionals. Um, uh, Dr. He's, sorry. Dr. Dr. Mercola? Mercola, so yes. Mercola.com, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I've, I've actually read some of his stuff. I, 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 it's interesting, just, eh? Yeah, very controversial, but interesting, yes. Yeah. Um, you know, he does get into a little bit of fear mongering with uh, you know, everything. It seems like it's going to kill you, right? But uh, but he has some really interesting articles and interviews a lot of interesting experts. So it, it's good if you if you want to look outside the box. Uh, there's some stuff on that site too. And I try to post some stuff. I mean, a lot of what I, I read about, I like to see what is backed up by some science rather than just dogma over the years. It's the way it's always been done. So I keep doing it that way. Right. But I also put it into practice, like I use myself as a human guinea pig. When I see a positive result, I'll, I'll experiment on my clients only after I've seen a good result myself. And then if I've seen positive results in them, I'll write about it and I and I'll I'll say what my experience has been and I'll and I'll quote the uh, you know the references that have led me to that that conclusion. Um, so I'm always open to hearing uh, different points of view, and it's uh, you know I try not to. And it's hard. We all have opinions, and I, I, I'm pretty opinionated because I tend to be, I, and my, my prejudice might be that, you know, what Oscar Wilde said, 
everything popular is wrong. And that's pretty opinionated, but uh, it's kind of like uh, the, the fitness trends, you know, what's in the mainstream and has been really trendy and popular. And often cases is not really the most efficient or effective way to do things. And right. the funny thing is it takes a long time for exercise science or, or current research to catch up, you know. Right. It's, uh, there's a real, like I said, a dogma in the industry, um, and it, it takes a lot of times times for things to, to change. But now it almost seems like some of the things that were controversial before are becoming trendy. Right. <laughs> so, right. you know, strongly in implement training uh, was like sort of frowned on or looked at as freakish back in the day, and now everyone's incorporating it as part of their workout somehow, you know what I mean? Right. right. You know, sled dragging and log pressing and... Yeah, and Matt says everyone has a damn tire now. Yeah, that's right. You know, it's it's uh, whether they know how to use it right or not. They're like, oh, that's cool. Well, it might actually have some benefits. You know, right? Maybe functional training is throwing around implements instead of uh, bouncing around on a wobbly board, right? right. So, um, so yeah, things come around now. You know, it's it, it, there's there's uh, the trends are becoming you know closer to what you know the the science or research says uh, is. is is the most efficient way of doing things, but it's still it's a slow process, and uh, I think it's always important to look outside the box, and uh, you know don't just jump on the uh, the Zumba wagon, um, or you know start uh, going into to, to yoga and stretching yourself out right away before just because everyone's doing it. You know what I mean? <clears throat> right, right. Look into it first. Um, but yeah, that would, that would be sort of how my my position would be to to sort of find out what's a little bit controversial, what's outside the box, what's not mainstream, and then try and validate that or look for reasons why that may or may not be, be true uh, okay. before I accept it. Uh, okay. But it has been my experience that a lot of the stuff, you know, I had worked in the mainstream fitness industry in the big box gyms, and I was like, I was toting the line all the, uh, along the way, and um, it seems like a lot of that stuff is based almost more on selling gym memberships and selling products than it is in getting you the most, uh, the best results in the quickest time. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's become very commercialized. I understand. I used to work in that industry, and I don't like it. I hear you. I mean, you know, and Scott has a great thing going here. Like his site is uh, part of my friend's no bullshit, and it's and he 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 interviews and he connects with people that have real world experience. And that's what I really respect. You can get a lot more out of a, a group like this. Uh, then you can go into like a, a mainstream uh, fitness website, or you know, it's right, looking right. at the, uh, yeah. the, the mainstream uh, fitness industry. So, um, and Matt's just saying here, <coughs> weight training hasn't really changed so much in the past 50 years. Uh, so when someone says they've reinvented the wheel, uh, you know, he calls bullshit on that. So, uh, <laughs> that, you know, that's a good point. I mean. There's always going to be new trend and fad, but um, a lot of it's been done. I still think there's room for looking at what are the more efficient ways of doing it. Like, uh, you know, exercise science is still growing. Uh, you know, maybe, you know, some back in the day people were doing four-hour workouts, you know, every day. You probably don't need to do that to get optimal results. So there, there's definitely things that do change. But, yeah, the, the, you know, the basic big compound movement. It's done with, with strict forearm, have you, you know, challenge yourself with resistance, progressively increase the, the challenge to your body over time, uh, feed yourself with the right amount of you know, the right nutrition. And if you want to gain uh, lean muscle tissue, you'd be in a slight calorie uh, um, surplus. If you want to lose lean tissue, you know, give yourself a little bit of a calorie deficit. Uh, there are some basics that are, you know, true. Around that, you can start tweaking some things like I talked about um, with hormones. So fat loss. You want to be in a calorie deficit, uh, a slight calorie deficit, um, and you, you do want to increase your, but if you want to optimize your, your hormones and maintain as much muscle while you're losing fat, um, you want to have enough protein, and you want to be doing resistance training or high-intensity interval training, not a lot or long, slow cardio. Uh, I had a client that was trying to lose weight. <clears throat> this is uh, before he saw me. He, did, he was doing cardio. Six or seven days a week for at least an hour a day, he told me. Cart he, he cartwheel? Me, what's that? Cartwheels, you said? Cart, yeah, no, cart, cartwheels. Yeah, no, he wasn't that dexterous. Uh, no, he was um, doing cardio. Oh, cardio, okay. Uh, and, oh, by the way, how is my audio? Is there a buzz at all? What's that? Is there a buzz in my audio? Is it 
Tommy yeah, Price, you know? uh, yeah, it is, but I can still understand what you're saying. There is a buzz? Yeah, there. that's sort of a buzz, yeah. Let me know. Does that get rid of it? A little bit. Okay. All right. It, Sorry about that. So he was doing all cardio for like six, seven days a week for about an hour at a time. Um, he was reducing his calories, like he was told, and someone had told him, you know, uh, animal products are bad. If you want to lose fat, um, don't eat animal products. So he was, uh, his protein was really low. He wasn't doing resistance training because he didn't want to bulk up, right? Um, okay. And he was doing tons of cardio, and he uh, and he uh, he lost weight, but he had the, his gut had almost not changed at all during the time he was losing this weight, and he lost a significant amount of muscle tissue. He said, "I don't want to I want to get leaner, but I don't want to lose any more weight. I'm starting to look like a, a skinny runt with a gut, right?" When he came to me, and so right. just by cutting out. All of his cardio, I gave him two short high intensity interval training workouts for cardio a week and three resistance training sessions, which I gradually built on, tripled his protein intake. Now, he wasn't eating very low protein, to keep in mind, at least a gram of protein per pound of body weight, right. uh, upping his healthy fats, carbohydrates were moderate in moderation. <clears throat> and he instantly started getting results. Not, but he was actually still lost a little bit of weight, but uh, much slower rate, but he started gaining lean tissue for a change. So his muscles were just starving for that kind of training and nutrition. So um, definitely by uh, making sure you're getting the right amount of nutrients and the right type of training, um, if you're in a calorie deficit, you can have a, a better effect on body composition. So it's not just about starving yourself and doing a lot of exercise. It's the right type of exercise and the right uh, type of uh, nutrition. <clears throat> Same thing with uh, sounds good. Uh, yeah, same thing with gaining gaining muscle. You want to be in a, a. I would say you can go a little bit. Uh, um, you can be a little more liberal with your deficit when you're trying to lose weight. But when you're trying to gain muscle tissue, you might want to have a little bit of. Uh, you want to be a little bit more moderate with your with your surplus, if you want to stay relatively lean. Um, weight gain might be a little slower, but if you got enough protein, you're getting enough nutrients in your putting your carbohydrates more around your workouts, you're going to gain lean tissue. It's just going to be controlling the amount of body fat you put on the process. Now, some people just like to bulk up and eat whatever they want. That's fine. You just have more work down the road to try and get rid of all that. And and that's another thing. When you have a really, a really high body fat percentage, um, there's going to be a little bit more aromatization. So you're asking about how to optimize testosterone. <clears throat> One thing around that might be to keep your body fat down. Um, if you have a high body fat percentage, there's going to be a little bit more conversion of your testosterone into estrogen potentially, so you, you want to, you want to uh, to keep that under wraps. Now, I'm not going to get too much into this, but I'm actually about to start an experiment myself um, on uh, supplementation. Okay. Now, as far as optimizing <clears throat> testosterone, talk about getting your good fats in. Um, in the four-hour body, Tim Ferriss talked about um, increasing. Uh, for taking more vitamin D and cod okay. liver oil to optimize okay. testosterone, eating more yeah. red meat, <clears throat> and um, and and certain other uh, other supplements that you can take as well. Um, now, there are testosterone boosters that everyone's heard of. And okay. I'm sure a lot of the listeners here, if they were interested in getting strong, they tried them, even if they didn't believe in it wholeheartedly, just probably gave it a shot. And tribulus was a big one. I, I, you know what? I, there's back and forth studies about it. I, I'm not totally convinced about tribulus. <clears throat> there are some that look more promising now for testosterone enhancement. DAA, the aspartic acid, is one. Um, and uh, I tried that just recently, and it's. I, I thought I've noticed something after a couple of weeks with aggression, with uh, sex drive, and with recovery and strength in the gym. But who knows whether that's you know sleeping better, eating better, you know just placebo effect. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. um, there are there are supplements that claim or, uh, to have a, a effect a positive effect on testosterone production. Now, DAA um, and what's another one? There's a new Macuna Prenz is one that's works what is on that increasing. Again? Macuna, what is that again? Macuna Macuna Prenz. Um, am I buzzing again by chance? Uh, you, you yeah you get you getting that buzz in again. 
Okay, yeah, I, I don't know what's going on, but we're going to talk about this and get all my audio and everything sorted out for next time, I hope. And then, uh, okay. Make sure okay. This is, okay. Okay. I just changed okay. my mic setting again. Is that better now? Yeah, yeah, that's better. Yeah, you know what? I almost have to change it like every 10 minutes just to make sure. Um, okay. So, anyway, so uh, Makuna Puriens, you know what? You want me to just type that on the screen here? Yeah, you could do that. All right, let me just uh, put that up for people here. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to choose a really big font here for you. Um, so, and now looking at what uh, research has been saying that looks most promising, I, I don't, I'm still a little skeptical about how much of an effect. I know these look like legit studies um, done on humans that that look like they could be promising for these supplements. Can you read that? Yes, I can. Okay, so I think I spelled them right. DAA is D aspartic acid. Okay. Testophen is an extract from uh, fenugreek. Um, they all work in different ways to increase testosterone. DAA is supposed to, uh, um, you know, affect your luteinizing hormone production to act on the nuts to make more tests. Makuna Ferrand is working with um, L dopamine, I believe, that, and it helps block certain uh, hormones that, like, um, that may interfere with free testosterone. So it works a different pathway. Fanny Greek, I think, also increases free testosterone, like unbound testosterone. So they all work in different ways. <clears throat> Makuna is sort of the new up and coming uh, one that you know had a little hype behind it, had right. a few real studies behind it. DA. In my books, looks like the most researched. So okay, okay. the aspartic acid is the one that, to me, and I did try it. I've tried all sorts of other test boosters. You know, once I started getting close to 40, I thought, well, maybe you know, I want to stay natural. Let's see what I can do. Um, I thought I, I felt something with that. Now, one disclaimer, in my opinion, <laughs> is that if you're a young guy and you're like 20s to like early 30s. Strength training, sleeping right, eating good. You're probably not going to notice a lot from these because your hormone level, your testosterone levels are probably already pretty jacked up. Right, you know, right. If you're a healthy right. young guy training, mm -hmm. so my uh, uh, wait, any website? Oh, I might just saying, yeah, thanks for writing these out because he can't uh, hear it. Right. Um, right. So yeah, the. So, but for guys like us, like uh, once you get late thirties and uh, you know in your forties and fifties, especially, maybe you want to look at you know other than what we talked about, some nutrition and training strategies, which I think are the most powerful ways of optimizing hormones. Okay. You know, what the food choices, your food, uh, the when you eat, what you eat, <laughs> um, and uh, you're obviously that your the training protocol. Maybe there's some supplements, and vitamin D is one I wouldn't even question. It definitely works. I mean, just pop that on here too, because yeah, yeah. I take I take vitamin D too. I uh, I've been taking that for quite a while. Yeah, I mean, there's just so many health benefits to vitamin D now. It's yeah, it's yeah. and actually it acts as more of a hormone than it does even a vitamin. I've heard itself. So uh, <laughs> it's really if you're not getting, especially in Canada where I am, you're not getting a lot of sunshine. You really need to supplement that. Yeah, I live in an area where I do not during the winter time, so it's okay, good. Oh, I mean, that's where supplementation. They recommend a thousand milligrams or something. A thousand IU, sorry. Um, I take at least four thousand IU a day, and in the winter I take like six to eight thousand IU. Uh, and I think uh, Tim Ferriss in the Four Hour Body was recommending higher, double that. Like, so it's. I mean, really, you can you can better from taking a vitamin D supplement. Uh, and now uh, Matt says, hey, I just drink milk that has vitamin D in it. Um, that's a whole other topic we can get another time. Uh, yeah. Wheat and dairy, <clears throat> unless you live on a farm, you can get it right out of the cow's tit. Uh, I don't, I try not to put milk in my body too much, just processed to the point where it's not even milk anymore, in my opinion. Right. So, I mean, we can get into that. <clears throat> It's uh, it's so full of chemicals and it's so pasteurized and it's so I don't know I it, that's a whole other discussion because milk it does the body good right I mean the dairy board spends billions on like trying to push that we need to drink milk 
And I won't yeah. question that, you know, because they have all like, hey, you know, that's got so many hormones in it right now, too, probably. You know, they're probably getting a good dose of growth hormone just drinking uh, cow milk because they pump the cows so full of hormones nowadays. Unless you're getting organic, and even if you're getting organic, it's still uh, it's still processed, right? right so, right. Um, anyway, I, I, yeah, you know what? It's, it's anabolic. We did studies drinking milk can increase your IGF-1 production and, I just think there's other health issues around that. Uh, wheat, again, you know, if you've read Wheat Belly, uh, more people than you know actually have uh, gluten sensitivities. Like, right. um, it's way higher than what diagno what the diagnoses are. So, if I'd say if you have issues with digestion, bloating, uh, congestion, um, you know, uh, mucus production, like uh, you, you know, gut rot, gas. Right. Milk and dairy would be the two first things I would go and look at, eliminate one of them for a bit, and see how those symptoms change. Because, uh, yeah, like a lot of people have problems digesting them properly. So, I mean, that's all a discussion. I'm not going to say milk's evil. Like, if you know, if your big goal is just to get big, man, and you want to be massive, and you don't care, you know, if it's not the healthiest thing for your gut, in your case, you're not. Yeah, milk will get you get you big. Um, you know, wheat. It's in everything almost, you know, but uh, I, when I was getting lean for, for body comp, I, I was eating maybe kefir and yogurt with the only dairy I was eating, and I, I cut my wheat way down. I didn't, I had hardly anything with gluten in it, and I noticed a difference when I made that change right away. Right. Uh, especially with sinus issues and stuff, they just disappeared, so. Right. Um, yeah, so that's, uh, that's another whole issue. <laughs> now, I'm going to be doing an experiment on myself because... I'm a little skeptical about testosterone boosting supplements, so uh, I'm actually sponsored by a company, SD Pharmaceuticals, and they. Uh, the reason I asked them about sponsorship is, you know, for my reputation. I, I I wanted to make sure it's something I was using, and it was uh, they they only sell supplements that have at least some sort of uh, third party research behind them. So if they got a university study or a doctor led study behind it, then they'll they'll they'll. they'll Carry the supplement, otherwise they don't they don't do it. So they got creatine and they got um, you know L carnitine and green tea. This stuff has been backed up by, by some sort of literature, um, and they carry DAA, um, and because it's got a lot of research behind it. So okay. what I did is I just actually a couple of days ago uh, I, I I cut my supplement intake way down, uh, except for vitamin D and I know multi and uh, maybe some uh, some way, and. Uh, for several weeks, and I went and had uh, blood work done, and I had my bioavailable testosterone checked. Right. So I'm saving it here first. I'm, uh, I'm going to go back in a few weeks after adding in uh, uh, the supplements you see on the screen here, and okay. um, I'm going to get blood work done again, and I'm going to do uh, what I'm, you know, whether how legit the study is. That for me, it'll show if there's a measurable change. Okay. Um, again. I'm over 40. Uh, I may expect that even if I do see a change, that might not be the same for someone in the 20s, right? Right. So, but uh, that will be an interesting experiment. So if we can touch base down the road, I'll definitely let you know what I find out. Okay. Okay. Josh, we're going to probably wrap it up here. What I want to kind of summarize here um, is uh, just briefly, um, uh I know that most of your, uh, well, I don't know, maybe you could tell me, what is the percentage of your clientele uh, as far as men versus women, and um, what what do you recommend for women as far as the hormonal optimization that you talked about as far as, uh, because they don't, of course, they don't have a excess of testosterone. They have more estrogen than they do testosterone. Um, is 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 your recommendations different for women than it is for men as far as that's concerned? Yeah, definitely related related to testosterone. I don't try and optimize that in women, um, but a lot of the same training nutrition protocols, like what I focused on for the majority of this talk, was on insulin and growth hormone. Right. And my recommendations would stay the same because it's. Um, I mean, most women. I do have some that are in strength. Um, and some, a couple that are athletes, uh, okay. but still, body composition and recovery are very important. And I think if you get the growth hormone and insulin and your cortisol in check, that will uh, have a positive effect for them uh, in every respect, as far as body composition and uh, uh, improvements and uh, performance. So okay. yeah, I, I just yeah, I mean the considerations for testosterone wouldn't be as much of an importance, obviously, but 
a lot of the same training protocol. Um, and, I mean, working around their their sport and their lifestyle, but as far as nutrition strategies and training protocol, very similar strategies. Okay. It's, it's goal dependent, though, right? So I mean, right. It's just uh, yeah. I mean, supplementation might be a little different, but yeah, a lot of the same same strategies. Okay. Okay. Uh, what? Um, okay. Any resources, books, videos, or sites that you want to recommend right now that people can look up? Um, any of the information that you talk about? Just give us a list of those, and then uh, we should. You still there? About, uh, my website um, is topformfitness.com. You know what I'll do is I'll just put that on uh, on the screen here too. For you, okay. um, but um, that has a, a lot of uh, free resources, and actually on my the home page of my, I have um, three ebooks that uh, can be downloaded as well. Um, okay. Put your name and email down; I'll send those to you. Okay. They go through some of this. Um, uh, most related to uh, my my thing is uh, get stronger and leaner, so it's okay. most related to. Either losing body fat or getting strong. I'm going to get uh, putting out a resource soon relating to increasing lean tissue for uh, like increasing muscle mass. But right now, getting strong and keeping your body composition and favorable, like less body fat. <clears throat> so, related to what we talked about today, the first resource up there, getleanbook.com. That's uh, my my ebook that I produced uh, that covers a lot of these uh, training nutrition protocols for losing body fat while maintaining muscle tissue. Great, great. Um, that's called uh, it's Get Lean Permanent Physique Transformation. You can find that at Get Lean Book. Okay. Um, and um, the the second one there. Just getting rid of the buzz here. Um, okay. That's my Facebook page, and that's where like I am getting more active now on Google Plus. But I that's this is where I answer a lot of my questions. So I encourage anyone that's watching this check out facebook.com uh, slash Top Form Fitness. Okay. Um, if you uh, like that page there, join that community on there. Uh, I'm very interactive there. I post uh, any blog posts or videos I produce that I think are of interest uh, to my audience. I'll post them on there. I answer questions on there. Uh, okay. If you want to get into discussion on these topics, uh, hook, hook up with me on there. Um, that would be one I recommend. And then my website's there at the bottom. Like I said, there's a lot of resources in my blog, some free articles on there. I'll link to some of my videos. So those would be the three big ones right there that I'd recommend. And people check out if they want to hook okay. up with me and find out more of uh, more of what I'm about and the information I put out. Okay, uh, so I think we're going to wrap it up, and then what we're going to do, because uh, you wanted to talk more in detail about the intermittent fasting, so we'll have another session, and that'll be based on your time availability. We'll talk about that off air. Uh, about about when you want to come back on and talk about those things. Also, um, I'm not sure, but based on uh, just what I heard from you, are you uh, into the paleo diet? Oh uh, yeah. Of? You know what? <clears throat> if I had to pick a trendy diet to give props to, it would probably be paleo. Um, okay. Now, if you look at my Get Lean book, I do talk a little bit about carb manipulation. Okay. The first thing I get into in there is like, hey, you know, the basics still are, you want to gain weight, it's a little calorie surplus, you want to lose some fat, you got to have a little calorie deficit. The people that say calories don't matter as long as you eat whole, you know, food, they, they may have a point, like I don't think you got to be calorie counting for the average person, but <clears throat> you know what, the basics are the basics. You got to eat a little more to get bigger, you got to eat a little less to get leaner, but then I get right into, okay, now what can we, you know, as far as the ratios of protein, fats, and carbs. What's best for your, you know, for staying lean and keeping muscle on you? And then I get into um, a lot of my, you know, carb manipulation, a lot of my other uh, food choices. But okay. it does have a lot of crossover to paleo, just in that I I do encourage eating a lot less processed food. Um, right. If you can eat food closer to to nature, basically, of course, uh, closer to how it naturally occurs. It's probably going to be more easily assimilated, more bioavailable to your body. You're going to get more out of it, less right, digestive yeah. issues, uh, right. more nutrient dense, um, and 
I do think, uh, you know, one thing about paleo is just because they're, you know, focusing on eating foods that tend to be less processed and closer to, like, how our, our ancestors would have eaten, it tends to be a little already lower, in a, lower simple carbs, like lower carbohydrate, higher protein and natural fats. So it, it okay. sort of already slants the, in that direction. So, yeah, I really like paleo. I think it's a, if you want to, like, pick a training uh, in eating um, a diet to follow, that's a good one, um, but I still think it's worth journaling. Like I use um, online apps to when I, when I really want to make changes in body composition, when that's the goal, losing fat or, or building a little muscle, I journal it. I use a free app like uh, Daily Burn or Fit Day, or I'm on MyFitnessPal.com right now. Okay. Um, and I plug it in there a few days a week. I just see where I'm at. Like, am I getting enough protein? Where are my calories at? It gives me a real idea, you know, and then I can eyeball it from there, but... Mm -hmm. People are just trying to guess, and you know, eat a little more one day and less the other day, and yeah, I'm pretty sure I'm getting enough protein. You know, when it starts getting to like you said at the beginning of this uh, discussion, fine tuning, like okay, you're eating, you're training hard, you're eating pretty good. I want to get to the next level. You gotta right. fine tune it. You gotta track it, just like you track your workouts. You gotta track your nutrition. You know. Right. So yeah, paleo is great. I like uh, intermittent fasting. is really interesting to me, and I've got some good results from that. Um, you know, the whole, if it fits your macros, guys, uh, they don't pay as much attention to food choices, but mm -hmm. the one thing they do pay attention to is where am I, what, where are my nutrients coming from, like what macros, and uh, are my calories in check? Okay. Um, so there's some things to learn from them, too. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay, I want to thank everybody that uh, has joined in, Matt, and uh, uh, Josh, I'm going to... Uh, ended here and I do appreciate you giving us all the information that you have uh, delivered to us today and uh, like I said off air we're going to actually uh, reschedule you to come back on and talk about intermittent fasting. Does that sound Thanks, good? Bro. That was great. I appreciate you having me on here and uh, yeah I look forward to getting on again and getting this uh, camera situation straightened out here. Sorry about okay. That. Hey, listen. Uh, maybe we can in the interview we can probably do some um, some trial hangouts to uh, try to try to see what the problem is, and maybe get you set up with a lower third. I think we talked about that as well. Yeah. For you. Perfect. Okay. Excellent. All right. Yeah, well, let's let's uh, after we disconnect here, I'll, I'll hang on with you for a bit. Okay then. All right. Thanks, All right. guys. And uh, anyone watching this, uh, just hook up with me if you want any more information. And I'll look forward to touching base soon. Thanks, Rick. Okay, then. All right, bye. Thanks a lot, Matt. And thanks a lot, uh, Josh. Yeah, no worries. Talk to you soon. All right, bye-bye. Right,